Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Step Out of the Spin Cycle, What to Know About Quitting Your Job to Provide Care and Learn About the Team Approach to Caregiving. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resource center, FCA Care Journey, please visit caregiver.org. Today, I'd like to welcome our guest, Rebecca Kaiser. Rebecca earned her Master of Arts degree in Health Psychology from Northern Arizona University and is a board certified coach. For the past 20 years, she has worked on both sides of the caregiving spectrum as a family caregiver herself and as a service provider doing caregiver consultations, and more recently as a life coach providing ongoing support to family caregivers. Rebecca's services include caregiver consultations, coaching, and workshops. The focus of Rebecca's work is on partnering with family caregivers to help them thrive as they care for their loved ones. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Calvin. It is such a privilege to be with you all today. Um, and I look forward to our, our next hour together. Um, as I talk, please feel free to, again, enter your questions in the chat so I can answer those after I'm, after I'm done with our talk. Caring, with a loved one, caring for a loved one is an important calling. However, caring is not the only thing that you do. Besides the role of caregiving, the average person has many other roles that they are fulfilling. One of these is working while providing care. It's estimated that 60 to 70% of caregivers are working while providing care for a loved one. Let me share a story with you. Janelle was caring for her husband. About five years ago, he had had a stroke and at that time, he went through rehab and was able to do pretty well. He was not able to work anymore, but he could stay by himself, take care of most of his own needs, and do some of the household tasks. However, recently he had had some TIAs or mini strokes. With these strokes, he had started needing more assistance with getting around, with some of his activities of daily living like dressing. He was becoming more attached to Janelle and hesitant to let her out of his sight. She was torn. As a teacher, she had been off for the summer, but the beginning of the school year was around the corner. She felt she needed to be back in school, but she also needed to be home with her husband. A decision of this magnitude can feel like there's no best solution. These two roles alone take a great deal of energy, time, and emotional investment whether the need to care for a loved one emerges suddenly or gradually, a time may come when demands are high and you think it's necessary to quit your job and withdraw from other aspects of life to fulfill caregiving responsibilities. While this may seem like the best or even the only path, this choice can have unexpected financial, emotional, social, medical, and care consequences for both the caregiver and the care receiver. It's important to know about the possibilities and to have needed information about resources and support that can aid in this decision and in the caregiving journey to come. Next. Today I am going to outline the impact on the family for both caregiver and care receiver of the caregiver working or quitting work. Lay out the steps to consider when making the decision that is best for everyone and provide tips for forming a team to provide the needed care for the care receiver. What will happen if I quit or what will happen if I stay working? Let's take a look at what others have found the results to be. A survey by the National Center for Caregiving estimates that by 2020, one in three U.S. households will be caring for an elderly relative. The issue of working versus not working is a question that many households face and has a big impact on the family and the workforce at large. 
More than half of employed caregivers work full-time. That's 56%. On average, employed caregivers work 34.7 hours a week. So you are not alone. One survey found that one in five retirees left the workforce earlier than planned because of the need to care for an ill spouse or other family member. The demands on the caregiver and the needs for more care for the loved one can present very real challenges in knowing how to best use resources and care for a loved one in the middle of a busy life. It's not a decision that can be made on impulse or lightly. No one decision is right for everyone. You might be saying, so what do I do with the demands of care? It just seems like quitting would be the best, more time and less stress. Let me share with you the impact of working and the impact of quitting, sharing some elements that may be obvious to you and others that you may not have even thought of. Let's take a look at the impact. The impact on the family for both caregiver and care receiver, the caregiver working or not working. One of the most often talked about of the impacts in working versus not working is the financial impact. We're going to touch on the benefits of both options. So the financial benefits include working until retirement, which can give you the benefit of accumulating the maximum social security, retirement pension, and 401k or 503b income for the caregiver's own retirement. It's estimated that when caregivers quit work to provide care, women lose $324,044 each in earnings, pension, and social security benefits. And men lose about 283,716 as a result of quitting work to care for a loved one. Another benefit is being able to maintain health insurance from the job. This is especially important because of the noted health struggles that caregivers often face. Then there's the security of having and maintaining a job that can be held until retirement, whether caregiving or not. Studies show that caregivers who quit their job to provide care have difficulty getting back into the workforce again. It's hard to know if and when you might need to re-enter the workforce. The average person is a caregiver for 4.6 years. And then working gives financial freedom to be able to financially provide for various care and medical expenses for the care receiver. However, the downside is that more often money may be needed out of the caregiver's pocket while working for things like home care adult, and adult daycare. For Janelle, she knew that if she quit her job, it would make things more difficult financially. She would have to pare down their expenses and they would need to pay out of pocket for her own insurance plan. Plus just having her husband's disability income would make things really tight. And then what would the future hold financially? Let's take a look at the emotional and social benefits of continuing to work. All right, so the emotional and social benefits include having an outlet outside of caregiving, caregiving that provides meaning and purpose, receiving social interaction at work, and a break from the rigors of providing care, seeing that it is not all up to the caregiver, but that they have an opportunity to see the impact of the care others provide. And in turn, the care receivers learn to depend on the care of others other than their loved one. Care receivers develop relationships with others. Caregivers and caregivers are able to continue to grow and build skill in their field. Caregivers look to the expertise of knowledge and knowledge of people and resources they might not have entertained before. And workplaces often offer things like EAP programs, which offer psychological, legal, and informational to su support to family caregivers. However, it's important to note that a parent or care receiver may be unhappy and, and complain about wanting, to be, wanting their loved one to be with them 
Um, and it's also less time when working, it's less time for the caregiver and care receiver to be together. Let's take a look at caregiver health and the benefits. With working, it can be easier to avoid burnout, financial strain, health consequences, caregiver isolation that can come from being the primary caregiver for a loved one. And it also provides the needed health care and health insurance for a caregiver. Benefits for the care receiver. One benefit is the fact that workplaces often provide resources to help caregivers and care receivers, including things like access to resource lists, subsidized care at times, and subsidized support services. Caregivers learn skills in their career that help them to provide even better care for their loved one. Another benefit is that the care being divided out is the care being divided out so that the care receiver is receiving care from others that have specialized skills in the care that, care that they need. Um, one example of this is um, in the case of an adult daycare center or a retirement community, having a specialized activity director that um, is educated in stimulating a care receiver with the specific needs that they have. Let's take a look at the other side of the spectrum. Deciding that it is the best decision to quit working to provide care for a loved one. The benefits of quitting work include financial. Money can be saved that would be used for hands-on care or services by other providers and used for other needs or desires instead. Another concern that often comes up in working and being a working caregiver is having the time needed to take off when appointments and situations come up. Caregivers that aren't working don't have to worry about having the needed PTO or sick leave to take off for appointments and care. Not working would allow freedom for taking more time off to care for someone um, that can be difficult while working. Let's take a look at the emotional and social benefits. 70% of working caregivers suffer work-related difficulties due to their dual roles. While those role, two roles, butting heads, are not really a struggle for people that are working. Caregivers don't have to worry about the quality of care received by outside sources as much. And it's easier to handle a crisis that comes up when having the time and having the time to devote to it when not working. The caregiver does not have to endure the sadness or complaining of the care receiver from them not being there as much. In regards to the caregiver and care receiver's health, more time can be devoted to care and medical appointments without rearranging schedules, being there for meetings and services, seeing firsthand what's happening in their care is a benefit. And there's less strain from feeling pressure for time to get everything done. The benefits for the care receiver include things like being able to receive more hands-on care from the caregiver. The caregiver does not have to worry as much about the quality of care provided by other caregivers. And the caregiver and care receiver have a chance to build more of their relationship. It's important to note that while I have shared quite a bit of information on the potential impacts of being a working caregiver or quitting work as a caregiver, there are potentially more pros and cons that I did not cover. In addition, the personality and relationship with a care receiver prior to making this decision can have a big impact on the consequences as well. So let's talk about what you do. When you feel the pressing need for change and are looking eye to eye with the decision to work or not work. How do you take all of these factors and emotions tied up in this and make the best decision? I'm going to share some steps with you to think about as you move forward. It's important to include in this process discussion with others, and education on what is available. Back to Janelle. She stood at a crossroads. Should she quit her job now 
and ease the fear of her husband and make his care needs cheaper or should she go back to work and find other care for during the day? I'm gonna share with you an acronym called STAKE because a lot is at stake with this decision. Um, and on the previous slide, which you'll get copies of, I shared a link to uh, a handout that you can use um, to work through this acronym on your own. All right, so steps to making the decision that's best for everyone. Number one is struggle. What's the struggle that's causing a need for change? As you're working through this, write down the different aspects of the problem and what you have already done to try to address it. Number two, talk. Talk with the care receiver and family that play a major role in their life. Let them know the struggle and the potential options. It's important to bring others in on the discussion. They will have a perspective that is important and maybe one that you have not thought of or they may be willing to contribute something to solve the problem. Try to take this additional insight without judgment. It's helpful if you all can approach it from a, an understanding and investigative perspective to start. Number three, assess. Assess the options for change from small to big. Take a look at the potential options to solve the problem. These may be small that just solve part of the problem, or they may be big to solve the problem overall. Again, take this as an opportunity to investigate without judgment. Exploring outside of the box options that may seem silly, but are valid. Leave assumptions out and think through options without ruling anything out. Know what your work resources and flexibility are for making change. Later, we will talk about just some of the changes that can be made at work to make caregiving life more doable. But for now, know that it is important to look at employee benefits, have a discussion with your boss and HR person, and think about flexible locations and hours that may help. Number four, know yourself. This is a big one. Given your needs in relationship with the care receiver, what are you able to do? It's important to give these things respect. They will make a difference in your stress level and how you show up for your loved one. Remember, it's not about quantity and being able to do all of the things for your loved one, but it is about quality of time and care you are able to provide. If you do not do well giving hands-on care, that's important information for your decision. Consider your ability and desire to care for a loved one. It may feel like the obvious choice, but if you have a strained relationship with a care receiver or you're doing it out of a feeling of guilt, full-time care may not be the best use of your talents and resources. Number five, experiment. Try some small changes out first and see the impact. Initially, it can be helpful to try some things out. You know, make a plan based on your research and the thoughts of others around you. Try out some things that take less skin in the game or resources initially before making a big decision. And then number six, evaluate. To see what worked, what didn't work, and what more needs to be done. Share these thoughts with others that you trust. Get their feedback and help. It can also be really important to consult with experts in the field like a therapist, coach, or pastor to help you evaluate. Let's face it, caregiving is important and demanding work. Janelle decided to go back to another year of teaching. She arranged for a couple of relatives to stay with her husband for most of the day. And then she would race home as soon as she could, was done with school to be with him and care for his needs. She liked how care from their relatives was helping. 
However, she was so busy at the end of the day that she was still feeling really anxious and hadn't been eating much in her hurry to get household things done. Whether you are working or not working, caregiving cannot be done alone. It's important to develop a team that can work together to provide the best care possible. In the unique calling to care for someone, it can feel isolating. Oftentimes you learn quickly who you can depend on and who is not dependable. Sometimes it can even feel, be easy to feel a distant, to distance yourself from other people because of trust or that feeling that really only you can provide the needed care. However, in caregiving and definitely in caregiving while working, having a team that you can depend on and draw on the expertise of is vital to provide care, the best care for your loved one and to ensure that while you have this role as a caregiver, you have the support you need to live healthy amidst caregiving. Let's, let's explore what it means to take a team approach. Building a team. Okay, so take a look around. Who are the people involved in the care of your loved one? And supporting you. The people that help with decision making, hands-on care, information support, social support for you and the caregiver or care receiver, medical team, neighbors or friends that help in a pinch, services that help with household or everyday things, even your friend that kidnaps you from work to take you to lunch. These are your team. First, write down your current team, including the roles that each one of them plays. Your team is going to be the people that provide support, time, information, care, and encouragement. Now think about gaps in the needs that are being met. What are these? What team members can you bring on to help in these areas? Are there things that you are doing as a caregiver that others could take off your plate so you could concentrate on the areas of care and relationship that are most important for you and your care receiver? As you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a worksheet, again, a, a link to a worksheet that can help you work through these ideas. Now let's take a look at some of the other services and people that you may want to be a part of your team. Team approach um, and possible services for the care receiver. These things include things like in-facility care, which includes care in independent living, assisted living, memory care, nursing care. These options either as long-term care or respite care options. In-home care, um, including things like medical home care, non-medical home care, like showering, helping with meals, being there to provide respite. Services like laying out medications, transportation, shopping and errands and therapies. Care in another location like adult daycare services, a senior center, or care with a friend. And then medical care, including doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, and a care manager. And there are lots of alert and response bracelets that can be a really handy resource. Um, things like the medical alert bracelet, the safe return bracelet, an emergency button bracelet. And then financial programs, programs to pay for care. These include things like Medicaid, long-term care insurance policies, and then special grants or scholarships that are available. 
And then just basic things like services in the home, nail care, salon and hair care, visiting physicians, house cleaning, lawn service, telephone or visiting therapist or coach, volunteer visitors or pet care. Now let's talk about the team approach and services that are specifically helpful for the caregiver. Your workplace needs to be part of this team too. You may need to kind of test the waters to determine who you can draw on support from at work. However, talking with your boss and HR person can lead the way to important support and open up doors for using workplace services, but also for changing how you work to increase your ability to better care for your loved one. It's important to talk to your boss or HR person about the situation. There are also often company resources that you have access to like resource lists, an EAP program for legal, emotional, care manager support, subsidized care, respite care, support groups, community services, and then there's also the possibility of flexible, a flexible work schedule. Things like flex schedules, working 10 hour days or nine hour days, working part time, job sharing, working maybe just less hours, telecommuting or changing work locations. The ability, sometimes you have the ability to use sick days for care or donated time off from other coworkers. Sometimes time out off without pay. And then of course there's FMLA for organizations of 50 people or more. These are other team members that can help support the caregiver in what they're doing. Some more services include care services like care, a care manager, assistance with paperwork, uh, organizations that provide information and referral, or, or volunteers that come through organizations. Support services like caregiver support groups, therapist, coach, pastor, or support people in your life like family members, friends, neighbors, and church. And then also as for your loved one, services that um, include things like an accountant, an errand service or grocery delivery, legal assistance, pet care, a lawn service or cleaning services. Janelle was at her wit's end. They had her income every month and insurance but she was exhausted and having a hard time getting all of the things done that needed attention and caring for her own needs too. She decided to talk to her boss to see if there was a way to work less hours to relieve more time for her husband and self. Her boss was hesitant to make a change. But as they talked to other teachers, it became apparent that there was another teacher that was only working three quarters time and wanted more hours. Janelle and her coworker worked out a plan for her coworker to share some of her class teaching so Janelle could be home two more half days a week. Janelle also agreed after much prodding to let some ladies from her church clean her house once a month. This also relieved some of the pressure. One of the ladies at her church also knew about an adult daycare program in the area. Janelle started having her husband go to the daycare program three mornings a week. He enjoyed chatting with the other men there and then he was more tired at night. So he wasn't as restless and then Janelle could get more rest herself. Though the arrangements for care weren't what Janelle had ever anticipated, she found herself managing easier and feeling a sense of satisfaction with how she and her husband were being provided for. A team with multiple players, each having a role and filling a need can be a great help. 
With the expansion of your team comes the need to effectively communicate. It's important to keep this in mind and be prepared for some of the communication needs and obstacles that may come up. Communication with a team. It's important to have regular talks or meetings with primary stakeholders and decision makers in your loved one's care. Keeping them updated and utilizing things like organizational tools to help you keep track of care provided, the schedule and contact information. And then if there's a conflict, of course, safety first, but then take a step back, evaluate before reacting, consult someone with expertise to help evaluate options. Talk it through using I statements to share how you are feeling or experiencing the situation. Recognize that within teams, there will be different expectations, personalities, and communication styles. I have attached a slide here at the end that has a list of apps and websites that are helpful and communication tools. Um, and I am also a big fan of multiple calendars to track and communicate the events that are happening. Summing up, the decision to care, the decision, excuse me, the decision to work or quit working as a caregiver is not black and white. Both carry significant impact on health and well being of you as the caregiver and the care receiver. Neither decision should be assumed to be the right one until you investigate more and learn about your options. There are many options for forming a work schedule and support that can relieve stress on you as a working caregiver. A team approach is an important way to ensure that you, the care receiver, that you and the care receiver have your needs met. This slide shows um, some articles that are really helpful when it comes to this topic and that I've used as part of my research for today's presentation. Um, here's also a list of books and you will have a copy of the slide so you can see better, but these are some books that are really helpful when it comes to navigating this area. And these are some um, apps and online tools that can be used for coordinating care with multiple people. These are some, just a few of the organizations that can be a really helpful resource when it comes to to learning about um, special programs or resources for caregivers and care receivers in the area. It has been such a pleasure to be with you today. I've shared with you just some of the many aspects of this topic, um, but I'd love to chat with you and answer questions that you have about this. Any questions? Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for spending the afternoon with us. We do have a bunch of questions, so I'd like to get to them right away. First off, we have someone who is uh, a little bit younger, say in their 20s or 30s. And would you have any special considerations for them in terms of someone maybe starting in the early stages of their career who is maybe considering taking more time off or even maybe quitting uh, a job to become a full-time caregiver? Um, that's a great question, I, and that's definitely a challenging, challenging, challenging situation to be in. Um, I would say, though, more than ever, there are a lot of different uh, options for working in situations outside of the box. Um, again, kind of going back to the idea of, you know, talking with your HR person um, and boss and just seeing what's available as far as long distance, um, you know, as far as working from home or alternate schedules, um, that can be really helpful. Sometimes um, there are certain aspects of a job that can be done, done easier by, by, um, from home and kind of working around um, and developing a schedule for doing those situations from home and then more from work. Um, or I've worked with people before that were able to um, work at a different location of their office um, 
that was closer to their home so that they were more accessible to their loved one. It's important, again, to remember that, um, to kind of, you know, have, look at the overall perspective of your career moving into the future. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to kind of switch roles or jobs, still working in the same career, but doing something that is um, less demanding as a way of providing more resource um, and ability to care for a loved one as well. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another listener would like to know about, uh, you mentioned this a little bit uh, in earlier that many caregivers have some difficulty returning to the workforce after maybe being gone for an extended period of time being a full-time caregiver. But this listener had in particular questions about some of the long-term considerations um, to re-enter the workforce after a long absence in terms of what might be, why might there be such difficulty in, in uh, re-entering the workforce? Maybe say of someone who's maybe a little bit older, maybe of the boomer generation uh, in re-entering work after they have fewer or lessened caregiving responsibilities or perhaps they ended completely. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the, the challenge that can be is that there is a gap um, a gap in working, sometimes this can be a hesitation or there can even be ageism when it comes to being rehired. Important things to consider are things like keeping your foot in the door when it comes to a career. If, if you are caring for a loved one and you're not working or considering not working, it's important you know, as much as possible to kind of keep your foot in the door of your career and field in case you do end up going back to that. Um, keeping up on education of how your field is changing, um, keeping in contact with your network or resources that may help you as you, as you re-enter the workforce if you need to. Um, but also it can be really important um, to, to really market yourself. If you, if you are caring for a loved one and then you re-enter the workforce, to really market yourself when it comes to the things that you've gained as a caregiver. Because not only do um, skills that you use in your career often help you be a better caregiver, but also skills that you've learned as a caregiver can help you be um, a better worker, a better uh, person in your workplace. So it's important to kind of consider that as you, as you move forward. Perfect. We have another listener who would like to know a little bit about being a long distance caregiver and how that, um, what, what they, um, what particular concerns a long distance caregiver might have from someone, uh, a loved one, perhaps in another state, maybe very far away in another city or in a small town, what particular considerations they might have in terms of deciding whether to quit quit a full-time job or maybe to uh, cut down on hours versus to uh, maintain that, um, that employment? Communication is a really important resource in this kind of situation. Um, when it comes to long distance caregiving, it's important to, to have, um, to have a, a really um, tight knit network between the people that are maybe local to the person that you're caring for. Um, whether that's a neighbor that, that sees that loved one or family members that have regular interaction with them, keeping in contact with, with them and, um, and hearing that ongoing day-to-day -day of what's happening with your loved one, um, it can be really helpful to kind of keep tabs on that and have those resources. Um, but also when it comes to maintaining work in the workplace and caregiving from, from a distance, it can also be important to talk to your boss and HR person, just letting them know your desires as far as maybe traveling more to see that person or checking in with them during the day, being able to call them. Um, it's important to, to, to talk to your boss and, and maybe there's a possibility for doing some work from a distance while you visit that person or um, taking some extra time off um, to, to go and be with that person. Um, again, sometimes it's helpful to sort of look outside the box and see if there's a way to continue your career um, doing the things that you do, but to do it in a different way 
working in a different way or working um, maybe less hours. Thanks. And then I have another question actually related to the boss and I guess potentially the HR department. We have a caller who has sick time available, but they've talked to their boss and their boss won't let them take this time off to take their husband who suffered a stroke to a doctor's appointment. So what, what would you recommend they, um, some tips or strategies they might consider when trying to get their boss to give them that flexibility to take care of their, their husband? Yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, it's important in a situation like that, to, you know, maybe the boss isn't uh, willing to um, have you use your sick time, but what if there's a way to um, kind of stack your hours so that you work maybe less hours that day um, and work more hours another day or take time off without pay to go take that person but also, again, this is, you know, a helpful time to have a team that's supporting you. Maybe there's a way to help other people in your network, um, other family members, friends um, that can kind of pitch in for you and be there um, when you can't necessarily be there at every appointment. Um, Maybe there's a coworker that can, you know, that can cover for you or donate some time so that you can take your loved one to get to get to a doctor's appointment. Really utilizing that network. Uh, we have another question from a caregiver who has decided they, they do want to stay working while also being a caregiver. They've decided that for, for I guess this this moment it makes the most sense. However, they have family members who keep on telling them they should quit their job to stay home and be a full-time caregiver, I guess assuming that this caregiver can somehow afford to not work and, and provide the care. Uh, I guess this is more of a family dynamics question, what, but what advice might you have for that caregiver in kind of explaining to the family that really this is kind of the only thing that would work for them, being employed full-time while also being a caregiver? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. It, there's nothing like um, difficult situations like this to kind of bring out all the voices in a family and, and some difficult dynamics sometimes when it comes to um, people's expectations and demands. I think it's important to, again, kind of have an open conversation um, with family and, and to hear each other as much as possible. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to, in a meeting like that, to have sort of a mediator, somebody that can come in and kind of just be a neutral voice that can kind of direct the conversation. Um, but it's, it's also important to, to note that there are times where um, you can thank a family member for voicing their concerns or their thoughts, um, but that you have to listen to um, the things that meet your and your immediate family's needs um, first. And so it's important to also have, you know, if you have those voices that are kind of intruding in and, and telling you what to do, it's also important to have those voices in your life that are an encouragement and can be realistic in helping you move forward and plan. Um, so also making sure that you are surrounding yourself with energizing relationships that can help you kind of navigate those care struggles um, but it, it, it can be really difficult. And, and again, sometimes it can be helpful to kind of work with a professional when it comes to navigating and sort of negotiating um, how different family members play a role in the care of a loved one. Great, I have a, another question here. Um, I guess this could apply to both someone who is maybe looking to re-enter the workforce and is having a little bit of trouble finding a more traditional nine to five job and also someone who is a caregiver at home, but is perhaps not spending the entire day being a caregiver. Are there some, some alternatives, some ideas for how one might be able to make some money uh, in maybe not a full-time capacity? Are there other, other sources, uh, other options for, uh, other than say a, a normal full-time what we'd consider kind of the, the, the standard full-time job? Yes, absolutely. There are some great, um, there are some great jobs out there that can be done um, 
you know, that can be done part-time from home or can be, you know, done part-time somewhere. Um, again, this is a great area to market the, um, the skills that you've learned as a caregiver and to be able to maybe utilize them. Um, one of the things that can be helpful is just letting people know what you're looking for, letting your network know, um, letting people that you've worked with or, um, or just friends and family know what you're looking for. Um, sometimes there might be somebody that is looking for, you know, a part-time bookkeeper or um, something that can be done. Somebody just said flexjobs.com. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of work from home jobs out there. Um, data entry, um, call center type jobs that you can take from your home. Um, again, it's there. there's a lot available out there, a lot to access online, but then it can be really helpful. Somebody said saying sell on eBay. Um, so, and I know that some people do selling through Amazon. Um, there's really a lot, a lot available. Perfect. We have another question from a caregiver who is a non-married single and also female. Are there any special considerations for um, women caregivers? We know that for now it, it tends to be more more female versus male caregivers. It's starting to equalize a little bit. But in terms of someone who is uh, non-married, single, and female, and maybe hypothetically we'll say she's between 40 and 60 years of age. Are there any specific considerations she should keep in mind that would might be different than uh, a male caregiver? Cal male caregiver? Um, I think that, you know, again, with it's important to, um, to really build a team that, that is helpful in meeting your needs and really advocate yourself for yourself, speaking up for what your needs are, where you need more support, Sometimes assumptions can be made that um, a single family member has more flexibility or freedom to do caregiving. Um, and so it's important in those situations to be, you know, a good advocate for yourself um, in making sure that you're helping in the way that you're comfortable with, but also getting support from others. Um, there, uh, there's a, a caregiving expert um, named Amy, Amy Goyer, and she um, talks a lot about her story as a caregiver, as a single woman caring for her parents. Um, again, it's just important to, to really draw on the support of, of other people as much as possible. And then um, I feel like I, I should ask this, but in a hypothetical, and I'm sure there we know that there are many people who are like this. What happens if you are maybe do not have so many great resources in terms of maybe a religious group, friends and family, maybe for whatever reasons you find that your network is maybe perhaps not as full as you might want it to be. Are there any alternatives um, in terms of building that team, having a, having a good diverse team that can, that can help out? Um, it can be really helpful to draw on the information that um, support organizations have. There's a lot of, of organizations that can help um, in the area. Uh, some, and, you know, again, based on some small towns, uh, it can be more challenging than others. Um, but um, support organizations can offer a variety of, um, of services, of scholarships, of things that are available to someone that is that may not have as big of a support, natural support network. Um, and, and again, I guess I would encourage you to, to draw on and let people know in your workplace what's, what's happening, what you're going through. Um, another thing is a caregiver support group can be a really um, helpful tool when it comes to networking and finding out what other people do um, that are in a similar type of situation. Sometimes even caregivers can collaborate with each other and um, support each other in the care that each one is providing. So those are also really important things to consider. Great, and then we have another question. It looks like we have time for maybe two more quick questions. We have one question from a caregiver who, for them, they made the decision to quit working and it's actually been five years since they've been a caregiver and yet they're still exhausted. You have any advice on how they might um, um, get 
and uh, for lack of better terms, uh, be you know be able to um, get back to where they were a little bit before and to to be less exhausted. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there is one one of the the really challenging things about caregiving is that often caregiving comes with that that real um, weariness and and health problems too that can come along with that. So. It is important, um, whether currently caregiving or caregiving is, is part of the past, to make sure that you're, um, that you're really kind of assessing and working through some of the things that you need when it comes to kind of bringing your health back and taking good care of your health and life. Um, so it's sort of difficult to answer this question overall, not knowing exactly what's causing the weariness, but I would say that it can be really helpful to get together with a professional, um, like a coach or, or a therapist and just, and you know, of course a regular checkup from your doctor, knowing what is causing, if that's kind of a, you know, a, a more of emotional um, rest that you're needing or, um, or if there's some kind of medical thing going on, um, it can be really helpful to consult with somebody. Um, but also kind of doing a little bit of a, uh, you know, it's a rebirth or a restart when going back into the workplace after being a caregiver. Um, think about what energizes you, what gets you excited, what are some ways that you can use the things that you really enjoy to get back to life and back to work again after after being a family caregiver. Perfect, thanks. And I think we have time for one last question. This is a caregiver who's decided they would like to keep working while also providing care, but they do have kind of guilty feelings about this situation. Do you have any advice for them in terms of how to maybe uh, get past those feelings of guilt for, for continuing to work while also being providing care for a loved one? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, you know, guilt is, uh, is a big challenge when it comes to caregiving, that emotional, the things that we're thinking about that, that prompt us, that kind of etch our way into our minds, and then we have a difficult time escaping them. Um, I think that the important thing is to, to call that out, to notice that guilt, um, and to kind of investigate what's prompting that. Um, and, and to make sure, you know, when we have guilt and we let that play over and over in our minds, um, it can really etch, etch into our brains. And so it's important to, to also really recognize and have um, work through the, the positive thoughts, the thoughts about what we're doing well and, um, and having somebody in our lives that can also speak into energizing us in the midst of that difficult caregiving situation. Um, knowing it's important to know that you're doing the best that you can and to have those voices in your life that are assuring you of that um, and to assure yourself of that as well. But, you know, again, it can be helpful to, to, if this is something that's pervasive and keeps coming up over and over, it can be helpful to work with a coach or a therapist to, to kind of work through some of that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, I think that's all the time we have for, um, for this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for attending and participating in today's webinar presented by Rebecca Kaiser. If you have any questions, feel free to give Family Caregiver Alliance a call, or of course you can call Rebecca. She works with clients in all 50 states. Uh, she'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, SCA webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find information on our next webinar on our website that's going to be in October on advanced care planning. So thanks again, Rebecca, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The webinar is now concluded, and we hope to see you all for the next one. I hope you have a great afternoon.